good morning, everybody. It is Tuesday, October 6th, and I am Marina Parkin of Coons and Parkin CPAs, and I'm joined here by Jackie Durham this morning. She is the attorney in our sister law firm, Coons and Associates. And uh, today we are going to bring you a topic which is a sort of a second installment of a purchasing a business series, if you will. Um, today, we're going to be talking about the tax impact of purchasing a business. And um, Jackie and I had kind of went back and forth about the things we wanted to bring up. We don't want to really overwhelm everybody, but it really um, is, there's a lot of information when it comes to this. So if we don't answer any questions or if there's something else you want to know, please send us an email and let us know and we can definitely cover it in the next round and I will take questions as well today. So please let us know. And um, also if you want to hear any other particular topics, please send us an email or message us um, because we want to make sure we talk about the things that are interesting to you guys on all um, aspects of whether it's tax, business, or real estate, or law of real estate, or tax of real estate, or business of it. So uh, <laughs> please let us know what we can do. So let me get started today um, by, by talking about now that you, you, you have either purchased a business or you're considering purchasing a business. And when I have a question, typically how a CPA would get involved is a call and it may be an existing client that says, I am buying a business. And I say, great, this is exciting. What are you buying? Um, I don't know. Are you buying assets <laughs> of the business or are you buying the whole entire business, um, you know, in its entirety? Essentially, the stock of the business is how we say it. And oftentimes the stumbling block becomes in that people actually don't quite know what they're buying. They may have a letter of intent in progress and they may have, you know, even a contract that's already in progress that may already have been signed. But a lot of times people don't really realize what it is that they're they're buying. If we're doing the closing or if another attorney is involved, a lot of times the person sort of understands um, what it is. But I think that it's easy to say I'm buying a business, but you really have to, to figure out what it is that you're buying. So the first um, part of it that I'm going to sort of tackle as far as the, um, uh, uh, the impact is concerned is purchasing the assets of the business. So this is the situation where you are buying just the assets of an existing business. It could be the name, it could be the trademark, customer list, goodwill. It may be the tangible assets, equipment, it could be trucks, it could be, you name it, whatever assets the business owns is what you're buying, but essentially you are starting your own legal entity first, which will house these assets and you will start the business. So with it, and there's a lot of legal implications and Jackie will jump in with, with a couple of those and I really wanted to sort of focus on the tax side is that we're kind of back to our discussion here on when you're forming an entity to hold these assets, what is that entity gonna be? And this is where you need to go back to the drawing board and say, great, I'm going to form an LLC and am I going to be a disregarded LLC? Am I going to be a partnership? Am I going to be an S corporation? Am I going to be a C corporation? So before you even, you know, get busy with the computer and forming your own stuff on some biz, you got to come back and say, what type of entity is it going to be? What is this business that I'm going to be running? What are the assets that I'm purchasing? And um, what would make sense to me? So um, that I would absolutely do first if really what you're buying is the assets of the business. Um, the next important thing, and this kind of goes all of this in, in our experience when we are the ones doing the closing, this all kind of goes together. So we talk about the formation of the entity, then we look at the assets. And when we're looking at the assets, um, what I would be looking at from the tax standpoint is, well, you're paying a certain amount for this whole bunch of assets. So let's say you may be buying and the name of the business, you may be buying the trademark, you may be buying fixed assets as well, um, but you're paying one price. A lot of times, and actually most of the time, I would say 99% of the time, 
when that initial purchase price is being negotiated, there is really not a discussion about the breakdown of how much of that purchase price is going to go towards which asset. Because you're essentially throwing an, a number out and saying, I'm going to pay you a million dollars and I will take all of this stuff off your hands. Well, and that is absolutely fantastic. But again, as part of that next step of the discussion comes, well, let's take that million dollars and let's allocate it now towards all of these different assets that you're buying. And that is a whole process in itself. So we're of course not gonna get into too much detail on it because that can get very, very specific. But some of the key points that I wanted to highlight here is um, we wanna look at things like lives, depreciable and amortizable lives of the assets that you're buying. So for example, if you are, um, buying a lot of tangible equipment and, and you're buying maybe a lot of trucks or a lot of, um, you know, just machinery, that sort of thing. And that is kind of the main purchase. Um, you want to allocate a lot of the purchase price to there because all of that machinery and equipment can get you 100% depreciation write-off in the first year. With the depreciation rules ever changing and, and evolving, you are looking at uh, being able to write off 100% of these assets if you choose to. If you don't need that whole big write-off in the first year, you can elect to depreciate it based on the depreciable lives of those assets. And typically when you're looking at trucks, equipment and machinery, furniture, fixtures, um, the tax lives of these assets are between five and seven years, depending on the type of asset. So you're looking at, if I choose not to take that aggressive 100% write-off in the first year, I still have five or seven years in which to depreciate these assets. So that becomes also a discussion on how much purchase price to allocate and how much depreciation to take in the first year. Also keeping in mind that assets such as um, trademark, customer list, name of the business. That is an intangible asset. And those assets are, despite the fact of how long you think it lasts for tax purposes, it's a 15 year um, asset. So that means you get to amortize the cost that you allocate to the purchase of the intangible over 15 years. So when you've, you're, you're dealing with that $1 million purchase price, for example, you got to say, well, if all I'm buying a bunch of crappy assets, but what I'm really buying the business for is the name. In that case, you may want to allocate more, of course, to the name and have the 15 year depreciation and then allocate whatever you can, at least to the furniture fixtures. So you still have a hundred percent depreciation, at least of that part. So it's a little bit of a game that you can play based on what your needs are, based on what is reasonable and what makes sense, uh, you know, based on what you think the tax position is gonna be for yourself at the end of the year. And the, that allocation oftentimes becomes a point of discussion because the, the buyer and the seller technically have to agree on the allocation of that purchase price before the deal is done. Be and the reason for that is the way you as the buyer will treat these assets on your tax return has to be the same way that the seller shows the disposition of those assets on their tax return. So if you're taking that million dollar and you're splitting it and you're allocating 800,000 to the trademark, when the seller is showing the disposition of the trademark, they better show 800,000 as the selling price of the trademark and 200,000 as the selling price of all of the other stuff that they have. Um, in theory, that works. There is actually a form that should be completed um, and both buyer and seller have this form. Uh, the form is a tax form and it should really be included in both people's tax returns. The key though is again, how you show the sale and how you show the purchase. In practice, Jackie being the attorney handling these closings can tell you how very few times this actually happens. Jackie, if you wanna jump in <laughs> for a minute here, um, well, <laughs> give me some thoughts about that whole price allocation business. Right, so there should always be, and this is one of the things we touched on in our first leg of the business purchase webinar, 
um, that there needs to be an asset pur purchase allocation that's called to be agreed upon prior to closing between the parties. However, people get busy and this goes typically by the wayside and they ultimately waive that requirement and wanna just proceed to closing and, and talk about it after the fact. I think that that can be really problematic though because like Marina said, both parties have to agree to this allocation and what may benefit one party uh, may not always benefit the other party. So there can be competing interests here, uh, which makes it a lot more difficult to reach sort of an agreement after the fact. Um, and it's even worse if people forget about it and they just proceed to file their tax returns, which with what they believe should be the asset purchase allocation. And it turns out the other party is filing something different. And now we have a, a tax issue and you have IRS calling you and sending you letters. So it's just, in my opinion, it's always better to just get with, take, take the time to get with your CPA and make a calculated wise decision. Um, and, and you might have to budge on that a little bit and meet the other party in the middle, but at least you won't have a mess on your hands after the fact. Um, you know, that's just my, my recommendation. And oftentimes where we see it is if the purchase occurs at the beginning of the year. So let's right. say you're buying a business in February, the tax returns are not going to be prepared until the following year. So now you've got about a year, you completely forgot. And now you don't even know who the seller is. You may have no contact with them. And uh, then to go back and say, well, then, you know, in the, and, and this, is, this is where the key is, is that we see clients on the tax side at tax return time, not when they're buying it. So the best thing that I can do for them is really come up with the best allocation at that time. So we discuss all of the pros and cons and the depreciation impact and, and looking at their needs, but we have no idea what the seller is doing. And we hope that it, the issue doesn't really come up or that the allocations are not dramatically different, but it is always a lot better when there's already something in place that has been at least negotiated uh, between the buyer and the seller and we have um, an idea of what we wanna do. Now, that allocation does not have to be necessarily asset by asset. What we're really looking for is class by class. And that really drives the, the depreciation calculation. So let's say you're buying a, a bunch of furniture fixtures, machinery and equipment. I don't need to know that in those furniture fixtures, how many desks, uh, and you don't, in other words, you don't need to agree about stuff like that with your seller, but you need to say, I am allocating 100,000 to furniture and fixtures, 100,000 to machinery and equipment, and then 800,000 to my trademark. So. The, these are the kinds of things because those big number, those the big classes is really what drives the depreciation calculation. Um, the other thing that is also very, very important to, to note is if you are paying your seller, and this is, I guess, more important for the seller uh, more than the buyer, but the seller oftentimes, I've seen these situations, forgets that they may not have received all of the proceeds or they forget to tell the CPA, hey, I sold my business. I sold my business for a million dollars. Excellent. So I go to prepare the tax return. I calculate the disposition and make them pay, you know, tax on their capital gain. And then they come back to me and say, well, wait a minute. I am on installment sale. They're not going to give me all of the money right away. They're paying me over five years. Aha. That is a very, very important tax issue because for the seller, when you're selling and you're taking back a note, you actually don't need to recognize the whole entire gain in the year of the sale. What we would do is calculate the gain and then we allocate the recognition of that gain proportionately over the years as you receive the proceeds. So you may get a big chunk in year one and we recognize whatever, let's say 80% of the gain in the first year. And then as the proceeds of that note trickle in, we recognize the rest. So there's going to be an installment sale form in your tax return that is very important to have in there because every year we will recognize that gain. So that is the key tax issue for the seller um, what also happens sometimes is they renegotiate the note. Let's say the buyer may have a hard time paying or they want to pay faster on the other hand. Um, 
it's important for us to know these things at tax time because that can either slow down recognition of capital gain or speed it up on the other hand. So these are the key things. And, and again, at, sometimes I feel like I am pulling teeth with the clients by saying, okay, great, how much did you get? And show me the agreement and show me the note and, and all of that stuff. But um, you may not understand that how important all of that stuff becomes on your tax return. So definitely wanted to, um, to, to, to talk about the allocation and the installment sale. Um, when you switch CPAs, if you're in the middle of, of an installment sale, so you may have had one CPA who uh, prepared your return when you sold the business, you continue to receive the proceeds, um, you switch CPAs, you come to me. If we don't have that installment uh, sale form in your prior year tax return, as the new CPA, we will not know that we have to keep recognizing the gain. So where we see that a lot is people moving from a different state where they sell their business up north. So people sold their business, they're in a five-year note, they move down here, um, they wanna switch CPAs, I get them, they're in year three of receiving the installment. Uh, whatever copy of the tax return they had may not have been complete or whatever the case may be. I prepare the tax return, boom, turns out, oh, we forgot. We also got paid on our, on, you know, our business. Um, it's our fourth year on our installment note. So these are all the important things make a big difference in your tax impact. Um, that's um, for now all I wanted to say about specifically purchasing of the assets. Jackie, anything else before we move into purchasing of the stock? Uh, no, I think you covered it really well. Um, definitely want to want to you know when you get into the stock side of things, I yeah, think there, that the, it's really important to note you know that we're talking about a whole different kind of liability, tax wise and legal wise. Um, we, we dove into the, the legal liability in the last webinar, um, but I can't, I can't harp on that enough. That enough. You, really, yeah. you were talking about at the beginning of this segment that you really need to kind of go to your professionals at the beginning before you enter into a contract to figure out how you want to structure this. Because if at all possible, I always prefer an asset purchase for clients over a stock purchase yep. because you're taking on a lot less liability. There's still some liability in any transaction and in any contract. However, the liability is a lot less than if you're actually buying the stock or the membership interest. Um, sometimes it's necessary to buy the stock or membership interest for a variety of reasons, licensing, things like that. Um, but you are going to have to really dissect that company on a more granular a level because you're walking into the tax liability, the legal liability, um, all the all the actions that have been taken on behalf of the company by its officers, directors, or managers or members. Um, all of that's going to become your problem once you buy the stock or the membership interest. So I just wanted to kind of reiterate that before we jump into the the tax analysis. Absolutely, because essentially you're stepping in the shoes of the prior owner. So the other owner leaves, you step in his shoes, you take on the mess that he is leaving behind, and We're now gone. you are left to deal with the mess. Mm -hmm. And it's absolutely right. It's legal, it's, it's tax. Uh, on the tax side, where we see is, let's say, if there's a payroll tax issue from the past years, you got to deal with it. If there's a sales tax issue from prior years, you got to deal with it. If there's any liens or anything like that. And this is where it is exceptionally important to do the due diligence when you're buying the business. We talk about the due diligence and this is probably a good um, time to, to jump into the due diligence. We would do due diligence procedures um, when you're buying either assets or the stock. But when you're buying assets, really our due diligence is really limited to, um, you know, kind of looking at whatever you want us to look at. Do you want us to look at how those assets have been depreciated, how much income they've generated for the prior owner? Uh, there's a lot less at stake in terms of liability. Um, but when you're buying um, stock, the due diligence on the tax side, yes, we'll evaluate the tax returns of the business. We'll look at, uh, you know, trends. We'll look at the relationships from payroll tax return to the income tax return to the sales tax return to the bank statements. We kind of look at different things and seeing if anything jumps at us that uh, it's not, one is not like the other, but the key here is then doing the legal due diligence, which is what, when Jackie does that, 
we look at all of those things. Are there liens? Are there any, you know, liabilities? Is there any are there any lawsuits coming? But you also have to keep in mind that the stuff that is not on when you're buying the business. So we do our due diligence. Everything is clean. If you've got a uh, disgruntled employee, they're still coming after you a year later if they want to file a lawsuit. And so that is the key with buying the stock of the business. Um, the other thing that is, uh, is that I also don't like in the purchase of the stock is you kind of still have to deal with the seller for a while. So mm -hmm. let's say it's an S corporation, which oftentimes when you're buying a small business that's organized as an S corp, you're buying an S corp. Now, what happens is as an S corp shareholder, you're going to um, get a K-1 schedule after the tax return for the S corporation is done. However, your seller was, an, uh, was a shareholder for whatever part of the year before the sale. So now you've taken over and now you are the responsible party to prepare the tax return. So you're very happy, you go see your CPA, you prepare the tax return. Aha, uh -huh. you still need to give the K-1 to the prior owner for part of the year that that person was an owner. Now you need to make sure you know where they are to send them the K-1, but it is your responsibility to provide as, as sort of the officer of the company to provide the K-1 schedules to all of the shareholders. So the one of the things, and I even have that on my list highlighted and, and, and double <laughs> underlined, is first of all, you have to remember to give yourself a K-1. Oftentimes, if it's the first time you're owning a business, you say, okay, I bought a business, this is great, and you're with the lawyer's office and we form an, an LLC, we let, or it's an LLC, you see that it's an LLC, it's an elected as an escort, this is great. Um, you may not get the fact that the past through income from there is now part of your income. So you go ahead and you prepare your tax return with your W-2 and your kids tuition and then <laughs> and then you come to me for the S Corp tax return but you had already done your own we see that more times than I can tell you and so then what has to happen is we first got to do the uh, company's tax return again you as the owner you've got to prepare that first generate the k1 schedule and then amend your tax return to include that income because remember, if you're a shareholder in the Nest Corp, that income is passed through, so you as the owner got to pay taxes on it. So you've got to now think like the business owner. You now have to understand all of the impact and the implications of, um, you know, the, the actual technical steps that have to happen. So yes, file the tax return. Yes, talk to my CPA. Yes, issue the K-1. Yes, prepare my personal return. It is, it is key. But now let's go back to the subject of a minute ago of having to issue a K-1 to the prior owner of the business. So what happens in an S Corp? And this is really, really funky. When you are coming in to the S Corporation and the other person is leaving, without making any specific elections, what happens to the income on the K-1 schedule is the S Corp files the entire year, because that's how it files. It files, a, let's say it's a calendar year tax return. The income then is allocated to both owners based on proportionate number of, of, of days in ownership for the year. So if you owned this um, business, let's just for simplicity's sake, say you came in July 1st. So you own it for six months and the other guy owned it for six months. So you're, you know, you're going to have 50-50. However, without doing a special allocation, you're getting allocated 50% of the income from January 1st to June 30th. And the other guy is getting 50% of the income from July 1st to December 31st, even though he wasn't involved. So that sort of you throw everything in the pot and you proportionately allocate. That gets a lot of people also that are unaware. And where we see that as an issue, if we're not involved before, is we get a K-1 from somebody else who prepares the return. Now I have a client who's looking at that K-1 and says, oh my God, that is not right. Particularly if the business changed dramatically for the good or the bad after the new owner took over. So now you're looking and you're like, well, I just sold that business, you know, why did it 
you know, it did so bad or it did so good. And now I have to pay tax on all of this income. It makes no sense to me. So the most common thing in that situation is there's a specific election to be able to allocate only the income to the owner for the period of time that person was the owner. And then once the new person takes over, <clears throat> they get allocated um, that income after they're the new owner. So um, that is very important. It makes that first tax return really, really um, interesting uh, for us to prepare because all of the allocations have to be properly done. And we almost have to do that outside of the tax return and make the tax return make sense. But it nevertheless, it's really what has to be done, but the election has to be made. The election is made um, at the time of filing tax return, there is a specific verbiage that gets put on um, right in the form and on top of the K-1. Then you can safely provide the K-1 schedule to the prior owner for the period of time they owned it. You can even have a supporting schedule and um, you know give that person the K-1 with a supporting schedule if, if they ask you for it. Um, so that is kind of the, the key that I see there. Jackie, what do you see as far as that is concerned when you're involved in the actual closing or maybe the post-closing questions? Right, well, we always in a stock purchase agreement provide for that allocation. It's clearly stated in the contract. Um, you can run into problems if you do your own contract or if the person who's preparing the contract for you fails to include that uh, because if it's not agreed upon that allocation is going to benefit one party versus the other it's just a matter of is you know is the seller slower when they're owning the business and then the the buyer steps in and blows it out of the water and now the seller's mad because they're getting 50 percent or they're being allocated 50 percent of the taxable income of the company um, when really they didn't realize those profits, mm -hmm. um, that's really going to anger some sellers. And, and, and the opposite can be true. Um, so it's really important for the parties to agree upon that in the contract. And I even prefer to have that form, if possible, uh, executed at closing, just so it's already there. It's in black and white. Nobody can take it back. Nobody can say, oh, I interpreted the contract to mean this, not this. Um, I mean, the, the language is pretty standard when it comes to the allocation. Um, but I, I, if, if we want belts and suspenders, I would also um, have the form executed at closing. And something I also want to mention, just real fast, jumping back to what Marina was saying about the due diligence. I feel like there's been a number of times, Marina, where I've had a stock transaction and I've brought in Kuntz Park in to do the financial due diligence. And we have uncovered some pretty scary stuff on the tax side of things for the company. And it goes back years and years. Um, and we've actually, you know, have saved some clients from entering into some pretty sticky situations just by taking a close look under the hood at those tax returns. Because I, I mean, there's been a number of them, Marina, where I feel like they've been a high audit risk because clearly the tax returns have not been prepared properly. Clearly um, there are glaring deficiencies and that's all going to be a huge issue for the buyer. Um, but if you don't have your CPA, especially a good one, taking a look at these tax returns, that can go completely unnoticed. And now all you've really done is paid a million dollars for a bunch of problems. So I can't, um, especially when it comes to stock transactions, I cannot uh, reinforce enough how important it is to have your CPA and a good CPA uh, do your financial due diligence. Well, this is actually good. Let's spend a few minutes talking about the due diligence because um, we have seen different situations and we've definitely seen, seen some interesting things. And really, th this is kind of what we're looking for in the due diligence. We are not going to tell our buyer that this is a good business or bad business or buy the business. It's fantastic or don't buy the business. That's really not up to us to conclude. Uh, what the things that we're looking for are the relationships between the numbers as they are presented on all different filings. So if you've got tax returns for the last three years that are consistent with each other, where you see some sort of a trend, and they're also consistent with the other filings that are done, for example, payroll tax returns. So if the number that is shown as the payroll tax expense on your income tax return is the same as shown as on, on your payroll return, this is great news. If they're different, something is wrong. 
And so really it's, it's for us to look at, and same thing for sales tax. When we're looking at the sales tax returns and we're looking at the revenue number that the client has reported to pay sales tax on, that better be the same revenue number that we see on the income tax return. And if they're different, there's gotta be a reason why. Um, back to my um, note about the trends, you know, of course, you're going to have years that are maybe going up, years that are going down, you may have an outlier year. And that's where we typically would reach out to to the seller um, in their team and say, hey, this is what we're noticing. Uh, what's the reason for it? And there's oftentimes a good explanation. And we make note of that. So having an outlier situation is not in itself bad if it can be explained. If it cannot be explained, that's when you get into into a situation. So we first kind of look at, do the numbers make sense with each other? Do they make sense with themselves as compared to, you know, year to year analysis? And then it's very important for us to look at the year to date numbers um, and say, okay, well, you're buying this business in July, give us, you know, the first five months of uh, financials. If I take the first five months of financials, do they make sense? in relationship to what has already been shown on the tax return. Um, this is kind of where a lot of times the seller may be getting the business ready. Who knows how clean those year to date financials are. They may completely be off kilter because now they're trying to sell the business. And we're going to say, hey, but you've done this on the tax return and you haven't done this on the financials. So these are all the things that we highlight because Jackie is absolutely right. We can uncover a lot of the inconsistencies. A lot of times it's a mistake. A lot of times an amended returns may be needed. A lot of times it's somebody trying to hide something. And, you know, a lot of people say, again, we're dealing with a small business. So a lot of people say, hey, I've deducted a lot of my personal expenses, as in my personal car that I use for business or the personal phone or part of my personal travel that was business related. Those things are absolutely okay uh, because we do back them out when we do the due diligence. And that's one of the subjects I'll cover in, in a few minutes about being able to do these things as a small business owner. That is not the problem. The problem is being, is, you know, deducting things that were not business related and, uh, you know, or not capturing proper expenses or not having the support for why these expenses were important. So this is the kind of stuff that we, um, would look at and we highlight and oftentimes Jackie has seen my due diligence review notes. They are, you know, longer than the financial statements themselves. Uh, but not to scare you on the flip side, if I sometimes get a set of financials, it's QuickBooks file, you can see it's organized, chart of accounts is clean, everything balances, there's a bookkeeper that's involved right away it sets my mind at ease that there's a system in place here, that there are some controls. And 99% of the time, and Jackie, I'm sure you've noticed that too, when there is a, a controller or a bookkeeper or at least somebody that's providing these financials, everything else is going to be more or less clean. There's not going to be something that, you know, we can uncover that's a complete, you know, we can find certain mistakes or we can find certain, you know, questions like, nah, why did this expense increase or this double, then it shouldn't have. Um, but, but but you can have some sort of um, reliance or, or comfort that the numbers that they're showing you are okay. Um, the other thing that we often look at um, is just flipping through the bank statements. We look at what what are the expenses and what, what what are the deposits and what are some of the expenses that are running through the bank statement? Sometimes we'll compare the total deposits to the revenue number. Sometimes it's not feasible depending on the business, but oftentimes what I will do is just, I sit through and I scan a couple of years of the bank statements and man, it's amazing. You'll see some of the weird expenses that come out of there. Never mind the personal stuff, just stuff that should not be in the business books. And so this is the kind of stuff, again, that we have to highlight to the new owner because, you know, they're looking at it as well. And, and so, again, stepping in the shoes, they're going to have to deal with the, the possibility that there's going to be some errors and somebody else may be coming after you. So the due diligence is extremely important. Um, but yes, our, our goal there is not to tell you. Sometimes we see so many mistakes. I almost want to call the person and say, don't buy this business. But I'm very careful. We have, we have said that. We have, we have said, said that. Yeah, I we have. have said, please, please don't do this. Yes. <laughs> That's but, right. you know, but no one, no one's. Nobody's no one's listening. listening. Exactly. You pay, you pay for my advice, but you, mm -hmm. you rarely take it. Yes. Um, 
I think that's I think that's so important. And I think to your point about the bookkeeping, this is sort of for you know if you're looking to sell your business or if you're buying a business and you want to make sure that you're doing this right from from the ground up. I feel like the bookkeeping is akin to the foundation of a home. Mm-hmm. You want to make sure that that is solid because everything else is built upon that. Mm-hmm. So if you have garbage in, you have you're going to have garbage going out, and you're not going to have a solid uh, you know financial foundation. And if you want to avoid an audit, if you want to make sure your books are nice and clean and tight when you go to sell your business, um, that's a really important first step that I think a lot of people, it's like an afterthought and they're like, yeah, I'll get to that. I have other more pressing things. And it's like, no, this is extremely important. Um, and another thing I wanted to mention is Marina, I think you've seen this too. Um, with some of our businesses that have sort of peak seasons, Mm -hmm. um, I noticed that we find financials being furnished, like current financials being furnished and the expenses related to employees and otherwise seem very, very low. Um, and so the, the income of the business seems, you know, artificially high and it, it doesn't make sense when we're comparing those financials to prior year tax returns, which are already baked. You can't mess with those. You can't fiddle with those. So you can, you know, the sellers can't hide from these prior year uh, tax returns. So we can kind of find those inconsistencies and help the buyer better understand what they're walking into because the income might look really high right now, but in three months from now, it might drop dramatically because you're going to have a higher overhead with more employees and and support that's necessary to support that peak season. So it's just things like that that I feel like people don't think about. Um, and and, and that, again, that's why it's so important for your CPA to take a look at that. Very the bookkeeping close. system, this is also a perfect segue. And th- these are the items that I wanted to mention, no matter how you're buying the business, whether you're purchasing assets and setting up your brand new business or whether you're buying um, you know, stock uh, in in existing business, having the foundation, having the bookkeeping system is great. And oftentimes when I do the due diligence and I see a well-organized bookkeeping and you know, we ask for things, they get it to us within days, just the system works. I always tell those clients, I don't care what you buy, buy this bookkeeper. They're coming with you. It just they already know the business. Please maintain them because this is going to be a person who probably knows more than you and can be instrumental in helping you. Um, you know, actually get the operation set up and everything because they're so familiar with the numbers. And I definitely encourage um, to invest a lot in whether it's a bookkeeper, whether it's a system, if you're hiring a new bookkeeper, you're taking on the existing bookkeeper of the business uh, to keep going. That is not the expense that you want to cut. If you're buying the business and you want to say, oh, I'm going to make it lean and me and there's a lot of places where I can cut costs. I'm not going to need to incur this cost. I'm not going to need to incur that cost. That is not where you want to cut. If you don't like them, hire your own, but definitely you absolutely must have a bookkeeper. Um, The other thing is, um, you know, this is now your opportunity to be able to capture a lot of those costs that we mentioned on, hey, I'm using my personal car for business. And, you know, we talked about those things when we did commonly missed business deductions. We talked about the home office, we talked about the car, we talked about the telephone. So this is now you as the business owner is an opportunity for you to be able to capture these expenses because, um, you know, as long as they're reasonable. So remember, and I say that every single time, for the expense to be deductible, it just has to be reasonable. It's gotta be required in order for you to earn income and you know if you're using your your personal car now to run your business back and forth dealing with the customers dealing with the vendors that is absolutely a business expense and a good bookkeeper that may already be there will also help you with that as well so definitely there is an opportunity there Um, there's also opportunities to you know bring your family on and you know we always talk about family income splitting you got kids that are teenagers put them to work in your new business make them 
do stuff, make them do admin work, make them do the actual work, pay them. You know, it's going to give them a great foundation for whether it's contributing to an IRA or a Roth IRA. Um, you know, there's a big planning tool about the kids that are going off to college. If you are, um, as a parent, if your income is too high, you're going to get phased out of being able to take a tuition tax credit. Uh, for your kid that's going to have tuition out of pocket. So uh, one of the planning opportunities is for the kid to actually not be a dependent anymore for tax purposes. They now have their own tax return. They claim themselves as, a, as their own dependent. So in other words, they provide more than half of their own support. And then they can claim that tuition tax credit on their tax return so that it doesn't get lost. But in order for them to do that, they need to have some income. And this is a perfect opportunity for your business to pay them. They may have a couple of part-time jobs. They do work for your business. You pay them. Now they've created this, this income base. Now they can really have a leg to stand on that they're you know, their own person and not a dependent, they get to take tuition tax credit. That is a huge planning point for uh, small business owners with kids. Um, but, you know, even if you don't have college age kids, again, you've got high schoolers, you've got, uh, you know, an opportunity to pay them, they can start setting up their Roth IRA, their IRA accounts. It, it is, and just, you know, the work ethic there, it, there's definitely a lot of pluses. Uh, and again, you're taking the deduction and, and it's great. So, um, this this also um, kind of brings me the you know the bookkeeping and all of these tax planning things uh, back to your behavior now as the business owner is you are now operating still as a separate legal entity so as much as we can capture those mixed expenses like your use of the car or potentially home office or your telephone you still cannot commingle funds openly as in if you're going out there and you're buying supplies for your business in Sam's Club and you're also buying supplies for your home in Sam's Club, you got to use two different cards. Um, one time here and there, that's fine. You don't want to get in the habit of commingling funds. And I keep harping on this. It seems like every single webinar leads back to no commingling because when we're talking to these new business owners, that is um, oftentimes the number one mistake, it's, it's, you know, oh, well, I didn't have my card or my card didn't come in the mail yet, or, you know, I didn't have the credit card or the points, Joanne's favorite, I get points on this card. No, there's no commingling of funds. There's no paying off the credit, one credit card off with the other. Um, definitely, you want to make sure that you are um, kind of in the, in the right uh, frame of mind that you're now, you're doing this as the business owner, you're doing this uh, personally. Um, you're going to have to start taking uh, reasonable compensation from the business. So um, now you are the employee of your business. It's, you can take draws. Draws are really, we call them either draws or distributions, whatever your lingo is, but that's really your reward for being the business owner. But then you also have to take compensation for the actual work you do as an employee. Um, so you're going to have, um, you know, income coming to you essentially in two ways from the business. But you need to make sure that whatever you pay yourself is a reasonable salary, uh, that it's not too low or too high. And this is also the area when we look at the, uh, when we do the due diligence and we look at the salary expense of the business, sometimes it's extremely high. And that can sometimes be a turnoff, but when we start digging, we see that a lot of that salary was paid to the shareholder, um, the prior shareholder owner of the business. And you're gonna say, well, I don't need to take that much salary. So th these are the kinds of things that the due diligence process brings is to say, how much payroll will it actually take <laughs> you know, to run this business? And if you are gonna be an owner who's involved, you need to make sure that your payroll that you're going to take is going to be part of that analysis. So you may not take the high expense that the prior guy did, but you need to be reasonable about what you need to take. Because if you're buying this business with the idea that you're going to be the 100% involved running in, you need to get compensated for your services. Uh, you can say, okay, well, no, I'm not going to count myself in. Um, even though you're really doing the heavy lifting and you've got, you know, four other employees in there and you're saying, well, my expense is those four employees and I'm generating this revenue. That's not true because you are involved. Because if you were to step away or step aside, you are going to need to hire a manager. And that's the other thing that we want to 
you know, always tell you, if you're not going to be the owner that's involved, you need to hire somebody, you need to build that extra expense into, you know, kind of your idea of, of how this business is going to go. So the, the compensation is an extremely important subject to discuss. And again, that can be, a, you know, make it or break it oftentimes in a small business if you're buying it. Sometimes when you look at the salaries, those are the biggest expense of a small business. And that can sometimes be a deterrent from buying it because essentially if you're buying it to work in it or are you just buying it to replace a job <laughs> you know it made, don't take all on all of this risk if all you're gonna really do is go out and get a job if you're buying the business with the idea of getting some freedom and the potential of growth in this business and getting your family involved or making it so you're passionate about whatever this business does that's definitely one thing but if you're buying it and you think oh you know for doing nothing i'm gonna be able to pull out this hundred grand a year in addition to my w2 that i work 50 hours at here that is just not realistic so um just having realistic expectations about how long things take and how much involvement you as the owner uh, are going to need um, that is going to be key and in continuing with with the idea of compensation um, you it's very important to look at um, you know who's getting paid because if you've got a key man that has been with this company for a long time that you want to retain because they know everything about the business and they will become your key men as well um, that again may not be the place where you want to cut costs. You may want to be looking at things and say, you know, how can I keep rewarding this person and and on and on. So, um, you you really want to look at at the uh, list of employees. And I know when we do the due diligence process, um, both Jackie and I review that list and say, who are the people that are working there? You know, if you have four employees but two or three of them are family members and you only have one real employee, we really got to look at how much real payroll it's going to take to run this this company but um it's it's going to be very important to to realize who is the key guy that you don't want to lose through this purchase uh who you want to compensate maybe this person has not had a raise in 20 years and now this is your opportunity to come in and and be a good guy and give them a raise or give them bonuses and change the structure that is also very important um and you know you want to build that into um your potential cost of owning this business a lot of times when i talk to the potential owners when after we do due diligence they're a little bit disillusioned and looking at these possible expenses because when we look at it and say okay this business was running this way and then if the if the owner says well, I want to be, you know, I want to give everybody um, increase in, in their salaries. I think these guys are underpaid. Uh, okay, if you do, unless you generate more revenue as a result of it, you are really not getting ahead. You're going to be funding this business for a long time. So that is, I think, uh, doing that process and just being realistic about the expenses is, um, uh, is key. You know, we can deduct like I said, anything that's reasonable, anything that is required to be incurred to to run the business, but you as a business owner need to do some analysis on it does it really make sense for you know for me and my family to to own this business. Um, Jackie thoughts there because I know you deal with with people's questions all the time about these expenses and what, what, well, how I much just, is it going to take. <laughs> I think I think your point about taking a look at the salaries and also taking a look not only at the existing salaries being paid by the business, whether it's an asset purchase or a stock purchase making sure that the buyer is aware of what they are going to need to pay themselves as an owner employee is really important because your seller might be underpaying themselves yeah. and that is going to affect how much net income you can actually expect to receive from the business because if they're grossly underpaying themselves, whether or not they've been caught by IRS or not for not having high enough sub, um, owner employee compensation, that's a whole other discussion. But even if they're paying themselves too low because they're trying to take advantage or they're taking too much advantage of the S Corp um, tax advantages, that doesn't mean that you're going to do the same thing, hopefully, because you do need to pay yourself a reasonable compensation. So I think, again, going back to the due diligence, taking a look at that will also give you a, a clear idea of what kind of income you can expect to receive based on what you're going to reasonably pay yourself and based on what you might um, reasonably pay other owners. And, you know, like Marina said, if you need to bring in a new manager, um, what is that compensation going to look like? So 
it's, it's a really good opportunity to plan, not only look in the, in the rear view mirror about the potential mistakes that were made by the company, but also a forward looking view about what you can expect to actually make from the business based on your needs and, and what you need to pay yourself. Mm -hmm. So. And that actually goes the same um, for any potential investment in, in capital, as in, do we need to replace all of this equipment? If you're buying a business that has a building in it, are, how old is this building? How many repairs is it going to take? You know, you're, you're buying a business that it may be a storefront, uh, whatever the case may be, that is equipment heavy or machinery heavy. And one of the things we look at there is uh, we look at the depreciation schedule. And if we see that those assets are old, almost fully depreciated, we are, I always highlight to my buyers to say, um, this is great, but uh, maybe in the next three years, you're gonna have to buy all new stuff. Um, or this building is old, you know, it's like when you're buying your house, you're doing the inspection, how old is the AC? Um, a lot of times when you're buying this business, you may not even be f physically here or you don't really get a chance to inspect it in, in a physical manner. Uh, you will the building, but a lot of times, even looking at the depreciation schedule, if you're in the early stages without even looking at the assets, I can tell you right away, I'll see how old these assets are and what you can expect there. And so that also oftentimes becomes a deterrent um, you know, in, in, um, in purchasing, in, in your decision to buy or not. Um, one other item I wanted to mention is um, when you're buying uh, stock of the business, you need to keep track of really what it is that you're buying it for. So if, you, if you're buying the assets and you're forming the business on the bookkeeping side and on the tax return side, there's going to be a place in your paid in capital or retained earnings uh, equity section to put in um, what it is that you have paid for these assets, because that's going to be, you know, the other side of, of your reportings, the other side of your balance sheet. However, the key in the, when you're buying a, a stock of the business is there is really nowhere on that business's tax return that you will be indicating how much you bought that tax, that, that business for. It's the same as you owning stock of Apple. Apple on their tax return does not have how much you've paid for their stock. They have how much stock was issued. So it's the same idea here. You need to keep track separately of how much you have invested in this business. And then if you continue to invest, um, you definitely need to track because let's say you bought this business for, you know, a million dollars. If you decide to sell it two, three years from now, that becomes your basis, essentially the cost of the stock would that you can now turn around and sell. Um, that is not going to be reflected on the tax return. Oftentimes as the CPA, I get that question a lot. Remember the tax return is you're stepping in the tax return that's already been prepared. Um, you are not going to be, um, unless again, you're actually putting in the cash, you won't have the equity. So not to get too technical here, but just really wanted to highlight uh, to the business owners that, that definitely you need to keep track of uh, what it is that you have invested in the business, um, including the initial purchase price. So um, I think we hit a lot of points today, Jackie. Any other uh, <laughs> any yeah. other final thoughts before we completely overwhelm people? <laughs> well, I am, uh, I'm going to try to squeeze in some of the local tax considerations uh, that parties need to think about when they're, when they're purchasing a business, and I'll try to be brief. Um, again, like Marina said at the beginning, this is a high level overview. Um, all of these things, I can't stress enough, need to be reviewed on a case by case basis with your, your legal professionals and your CPAs because the um, implications to your particular situation are going to be different. Um, so I just want to say that out loud. And of course, if you guys have any questions after the fact, um, just give us a call or, or uh, shoot us an email. So I'm going to try to touch on uh, some of the sales tax considerations. Um, if you are purchasing a business via an asset purchase, which I feel like is, like I said, my preference and more common than a stock purchase. If you're taking that route, a lot of parties think, okay, since I'm not buying the stock, then I'm not liable for the seller's um, issues from the past, be it federal tax, sales tax, or otherwise. And that is simply not true. Um, when it comes to when it, go, when it comes to federal tax, that's true. But when it comes to state tax, uh, Florida law imposes the tax liability of the seller upon the purchaser of a business when they're purchasing 50% or more of the assets of the business. 
so long as the tax liability arose from the operation of the business. Now, there is a way to stop this and you have to obtain what is called a certificate of compliance. It's really easy to obtain off the uh, Department of Revenue's website. It takes about five days to arrive. It's very, very simple. And it's basically the department issuing a statement saying, we don't have any audit pending. The, the seller has paid the taxes that are due. Um, and it's a sheet of paper that will become very valuable to a buyer because you never know, um, unbeknownst to the seller and the buyer, they may, there may be later a um, assessment against the seller for sales or use tax that they were completely oblivious to. Um, people make mistakes and not all sellers are trying to be sneaky, but sometimes they might have bad bookkeeping um, or they might simply be getting bad tax advice mm -hmm. and later discover that there is some trickling tax liability. Um, that can be assessed against the buyer, as I mentioned. So it's really important to make sure you get that certificate of compliance because that is a way to protect yourself from that trickling liability. Um, I will also say that I've been involved in transactions where we order the certificate of compliance and lo and behold, there is some tax liability that the seller was completely, completely unaware of. Um, so we've been able to address that and, and take care of the tax liability for the closing so that it doesn't become an issue for the buyer. So again, can't, um, you know, can't harp on that enough, how important that is. I, I'm a little, it's a little unsettling that a lot of people, even practitioners are not aware of this. So it's, it's relatively new. Um, it's only been in effect for, it's been in effect for less than 10 years. So that might be why certain professionals and brokers are not aware of it. Um, but if you are, if you have a strong appetite for risk and you're going to do your own transaction, which I don't recommend, but if you decide to do that, um, at the very least, you need to make sure that you get this certificate of compliance. Um, something else I would note about that is there is something called a tax clearance letter that looks and appears to be very similar to a certificate of compliance, but from a legal standpoint, it doesn't pack the same punch. It's not going to stop the Department of Revenue from pursuing a buyer for, this, for the uh, local tax liability of the seller. I don't know why they do this, but they, they basically put the button for the tax clearance letter very close to the button for the certificate of compliance <laughs> letter on the Department of Revenue's <laughs> website. So a lot of people naturally click for the tax clearance letter and they proffer that to me. And I'm like, no, 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 we need the certificate of compliance. So um, again, if you're doing this on your own, please, please be sure that you're grabbing the right letter, which is the certificate of compliance. Um, it's almost also, cartoonish where you have the two buttons, like this gets me a coffee, this ends the world. <laughs> I just don't, I don't know why they do that to people. It's, it's all, <laughs> it's kind of me. Um, the other thing I want to mention about sales tax is sales tax is not going to come into play when we're dealing with a stock sale, but when we're dealing with the sale of assets, there is a common misconception that sales tax does not apply to the sale of assets. Um, and people assume this because there is an exemption that Florida offers for isolated or occasional sales of assets. So to a certain extent, yes, the sale of your assets may be uh, subject to that exemption and you might enjoy the benefit of that exemption for all of the assets, but there are certain exclusions and there are certain conditions to a seller enjoying that exemption. Um, and I'm saying this, I know that this, this webinar is targeted to buyers of businesses, um, and I want to mention that this is your problem too, because the, the sales tax that can be generated by an asset purchase is going to be assessed against the buyer and the seller. They can come after you both. So this is important to our buyers as well. <clears throat> so uh, the exemption, like I mentioned, is for isolated or occasional sales. Um, this is only going to extend to the extent that a seller has uh, completed no more than two sales within a uh, 12 month period of their assets. If you get to the third sale, that's gonna be subject completely to the sales tax liability. So it's really important to ask these questions at the beginning of the transaction to determine how many sales of assets the seller has completed in the last 12 month period. Uh, in fact, we, we included in our, our questionnaire at the beginning of the transaction, we asked the, the seller this question. And then if I'm representing the buyer, I also put that into the representations of the contract. I shove it into the seller's affidavit as well. I want to make sure that the seller is, is being honest about this because it can really have some heavy implications for sales tax purposes. Um, <clears throat> some other things to note about this exemption. Inventory is not included in this exemption. 
anything that's required to be registered with a state, such as vehicles, boats, and planes, that is not included in the exemption. And also salvage and scrap material is not included. Um, and where I see that a lot is if we have, say, a delivery business that's being sold and the vehicles are being sold and maybe there's some vehicles that have fallen into disrepair, um, but that scrap is being sold as part of the fleet, um, even that scrap material, even though it's not going to be registered with the DMV, that still is going to be subject to the sales tax that needs to be remitted. Um, in addition, another condition uh, for a transaction enjoying this exemption is that the proper sales tax was paid on the assets at the time that the seller acquired the assets and also that the assets weren't held for resale. So typically, if you're holding assets for resale, you haven't paid sales tax on them. You, you obtain them and you have a resale certificate. If that's the case, the Department of Revenue, even if the buyer presents a resale certificate at the time they complete the asset purchase, they're still gonna be liable for the sales tax uh, because the Department of Revenue doesn't want to essentially create a situation where we're skipping over two purchasers of assets um, in, in assessing that sales tax liability. So again, this is a question for your seller. Did you pay the sales tax at the time you acquired these assets? Now, what I do recommend to clients is don't turn yourself inside out if we're dealing with older assets, because there is a statute of limitations on how long and how far back the Department of Revenue can go to make an assessment. So if these assets are 10 or 15 years old, don't bother chasing down receipts and invoices showing that the seller paid the sales tax when they acquired these assets. But if they're on the younger side, you need to get with your, your legal professionals to um, determine which assets you really need to press the seller to confirm were actually purchased and were actually, um, you know, the proper sales tax was remitted for. Um, the other one last thing I wanted to mention on this is the, if you have a series of sales, um, you're going to want to take a closer look at this. So if your seller comes back and says, yeah, I've actually completed a couple of these sales um, I've been selling off my assets and pieces over the last 12 months. Not only are you going to want to take a look at how many sales have taken place, but the time frame in which they have taken place. Because if you have a cluster of sales that took place within a 30-day period, uh, the Department of Revenue may consider this to be one sale. So that can keep your headcount down, which means you might still enjoy the exemption. But it, again, it's something you need to take a close look at with your, uh, with your attorney and, and your accountants. Um, one other thing I want to mention is for doc stamp considerations. A lot of parties will do these private transactions um, outside of uh, the, the oh, yeah. account. <laughs> <laughs> and, and I understand that I understand if you're dealing with a small transaction, people want to save on the on the legal expenses. I don't recommend it, but I know it happens. And a lot of times after the fact, I will see someone come in and there is a some kind of installment agreement or promissory note but no one's paid documentary stamp tax on that. Um, and I wanna just reiterate to everyone, the documentary stamp tax is due on any written obligation to repay a debt. So whether that's on a napkin baked into the contract or in a promissory note, and whether or not it's subject to a lien, um, documentary stamp tax of 35 cents per hundred dollars of that obligation is going to be due to the Florida Department of Revenue. So. Again, I've seen people come in and I'm looking at a, a contract that's two years old and I ask where, you know, where the doc stamps paid. Oh, no, 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 we didn't sign a promissory note. We were really careful not to sign a promissory note. Well, that doesn't matter. It's just a written obligation to repay. So um, keep that in mind if you're going to uh, do this on your own. Um, the other thing I just wanted to also mention really quickly is if we're dealing with a stock sale or a membership interest sale, you also really want to take a look at the assets of the business, not only for due diligence purposes, but also um, to consider if there is any real estate held by that particular company. You really need to take a close look at what kind of consideration was paid at the time the company acquired that real estate. Because if the real estate was acquired for less than the fair market value of the property, uh, the company you're buying into will be considered a conduit entity. Um, and I'm not going to get into all the details of how that works, but the long and short of it is if you're a conduit entity and you sell the stock or the membership interest of your company within three years of acquiring the real estate that created you as a conduit entity, that will trigger doc stamps. Um, and I will say that, you know, I've looked at those doc stamp statutes more times than I can count. 
Mm -hmm. uh, but I still, every time I have a transaction involving a stock sale or a transfer of membership interest, and there is real estate held, I always have to go back and take a close look at when these properties were acquired, what consideration was paid. And I always have to go back and really study the statutes again, because it all can vary on a case by case basis. So you really want to take a close look at this. Um, and more importantly, have your attorney and your CPA take a close look at these items. Um, and uh, of course, you know, if there's any questions about this, I know I kind of ran through this quickly and we're talking at a very high level, but I'm happy to answer any questions that anyone might have about their particular situation because it really does need to be examined on a, on a case by case basis. This is wonderful. All I have. <laughs> we, gave, we gave everybody an earful. Now let's, oh, yeah. now let's see how many of them are going to go and go out and buy these businesses. But, uh, <laughs> If we ran over, but just a little bit, and this is all extremely important, this recording is also going to be available. So for those that uh, only got a bit of it or who are not tuned in, you can always go on our YouTube, on our Facebook page and on our website and listen to these recordings. Um, thank you everybody so much for tuning in. We will be back again next Tuesday with another exciting tax and legal uh, topic. And until then, we will see you later. Thank you so much.